Domingue Barry is a PhD student in our lab. He, uh, he did his undergrad study in mechanical engineer in Sherbrooke University. Um, for his final project, he worked with the company Exonetic on, on a robotic arm. And he's now in the lab since, I forgot how many times, how much times? 2000. One year and a half. One, and, one uh... year and a half. <laughs> And he, he did this uh, transition from uh, ma accelerate transition from master to, to PhD. And he's, he's now working on control for unmanned ground vehicle. Um, and that's about it. I will let him present from now. All right. So I will start sharing my screen. So can you guys see, uh, just to make sure, can you guys see the, the the presentation and the tiny laser pointer. Yes. OK, perfect. So I will start now. Uh, thank you all for taking the time for uh, to attend this uh, webinar on the, the article that we submitted to the this year's conference on computer and robot, robot vision that took, took place back in May virtually due to the COVID uh, situation. The article is entitled Evaluation of Skid Steering Kinematic Models for subarctic environments. It was submitted, submitted by me and the precious help of eight of my colleagues. I will name them now. So there was me, Vincent Gordin, Simon Pierre Deschaines, Johan Lacan, Maxime Vaitis, Vladimir Kubelka, André Galland, Philippe Gigard, and François Pomerl. So thanks again for your help to all of these guys. Many of them are here today. And I hope I can give you a good summary of what we did for this article. So first of all, I wanted to show you a quick video showing where this, uh, what are the objectives for our research program uh, related to control. So I will just show you this quick video so you have an overall idea of where it, uh, what are our, our objectives and why do we do this. So we all remember that uh, infamous Montreal car crash video. So what we ask is what happens in winter conditions and how can we uh, solve the robustness issues that arise when we drive in winter conditions or harsh or complex off-road conditions. So as we can see, the robot tends to get stuck and our goal is to allow the vehicles to be autonomous even though it's navigating in for example, deep snow or crossing a snowbank, for example. And the last objective is to do the, the deployments in the worst possible conditions to robustly validate, uh, thoroughly validate the algorithms that we study. So this, uh, this article uh, was published uh, linked to a research program that was started by uh, the lab, uh, one of the lab uh, professors, François Pomerleau, and the uh, the project is called Snow or Self Driving Navigation Optimized for Winter. And the goal of the project is relatively simple. The goal is to adapt the autonomous navigation pipeline to harsh winter conditions. So we could break down the autonomous navigation pipelines to three main components namely, uh, localization, path planning, and path following. Uh, this presentation will be linked to control, therefore, linked to path following. Uh, and also for this project, for experimental validation, we deploy a ClearPath rob Robotics Wartug on main ground vehicle, which is a Alphaton robot uh, in the Mamarasi forest that belongs to Laval University, with the goal to uh, make deployments in the most unstructured, dynamic environments that we can create. So we have a thorough robustness evaluation of our and the state of the art algorithms. So first of all, how can we model a mobile robot? Uh, a mobile robot can be modeled the, the most simplest way as a body a frame of reference uh, that is defined uh, with its origin located at the center of the robot's body with the x-axis pointing towards the forward direction of the vehicle that navigates into a world frame. So the, the world frame here is defined in red. 
And the goal is to have the reference frame uh, follow a desired trajectory that is here defined in black. Such systems can be uh, modeled with a general uh, differential equation, a nonlinear differential equation that's shown here. Uh, if we break down this equation, we can see that the, the, uh, the, the model formulation is defined in the F component. So this is a nonlinear motion model that will uh, allow to compute the variations in the state vector. The state vector for a mobile robot is typically composed of the position and orientation of the robot in the world frame. Uh, it requires input, an input vector, which uh, constitutes the command that we send to the robot. So basically, uh, for example, with the car, the steering angle and the wheel velocities that we ask for it to, to, to get. And also, lastly, uh, the model uh, requires some uh, model parameters to allow the model to generalize to various platforms or various environments, which is the case for our research project. So overall, our objectives for the, the control part of the SNOW project. Uh, we split the objectives into two main theoretical objectives. The first one is to uh, implement and increase the robustness of the state-of-the-art motion modeling uh, techniques. So th these techniques, what they aim to do is to improve the accuracy that we can get when we define a model formulation as F and how we uh, manage to tune and track the model parameters to allow models to be as accurate as possible. And then the goal is to use these models with the state-of-the-art path following techniques in order to increase the robustness of these techniques to uh, more and more gradually more complex situations. Uh, also, the goal for all of this, uh, the, those two objectives is to do a thorough uh, experimental validation and analysis of what we get when we deploy those algorithms with a full-scale platform in a, in a fully, fully unstructured environment. Today, the goal of the presentation, also since it's the beginning of my PhD, the goal is to focus on motion modeling techniques. So the following presentation and the article was solely uh, based on motion modeling techniques. Why is a motion model so important? Um, I try, I'm going to try to explain it to you through the following small uh, figure. So let's imagine we have a, a mobile robot that is driving, for example, on a concrete road here. And we have next to the road some relatively narrow and filled with obstacle uh, snowy path that will lead to the goal that we would like to get to with our vehicle. For example, we would like to pick up some logs or we would like to go uh, rescue some, someone who's stuck at uh, this goal. So the first step would be to plan for a trajectory that is shown in blue here that will allow our robot to get to our goal. And then our second step would be to follow this trajectory. So first step, as long as we drive on roads, we might have tuned our model properly for the, the road conditions. And the, the path following algorithm will probably work quite well on the ideal conditions that are like the, the road-like conditions. However, if we get to the, the point where we change uh, terrain type, for example, here we're going, going to maybe cross a snowbank and start rolling in snow, the traction conditions are probably going to change. And if we keep sending the same values as if we're driving on concrete, we have a risk to uh, not properly follow the defined trajectory and maybe hit obstacles when the paths become more narrow. So that's something we definitely don't want. So if we had a model that was able to account for the change, in vari the, the change in traction conditions, for example, the robot doesn't turn as smoothly as when it was driving on concrete, we could have planned for different uh, commanded inputs to allow the vehicle to have a better path following performance when it switched terrain type. So it would be more robust to this type of change in terrain conditions. And then it will allow us to get to our goal safely without hitting any obstacles with our vehicle. So the very basic, the, the, the fundamental element of every uh, motion model for mobile robots is constituted of the uh, steering geometry that we use for our vehicle. This consists of how the vehicle is constructed and how can we send commands to the vehicle in order to get it to change its orientation or go forwards turn 
uh, whatever we want to do with our vehicle. So I show, I've shown you here in this slide three of the what we think are the most popular steering geometries that were explored in the literature. Of course, there are many more. However, we focused on these because they are the most widespread ones and also they allow us to get a good, a good idea of what the steering geometry looks like. So the first one I would show you is the differential drive robot. This robot is constituted of two wheels and a chassis. And we're going to send commands that will uh, modulate the speed of the wheels on each side that will allow to go forward and turn with our robot. As an example for this robot, we have the Roomba robots that we use to clean our homes automatically. If we take it a bit a step further, we have a very similar steering geometry, but which is more complex due to the fact that the skid steering geometry has four wheels instead of two wheels. And we have four wheels here, but it could be four or more wheels. So we could have an eight wheel skid steering geometry or even full tracks that go to the full length of the, the robot side. So the, the skid steering geometry is very similar to the differential drive geometry uh, due to the fact that it uses the same input vector. So the wheels on the left side will be commanded to go to a certain velocity. The same will be done with the right side uh, uh, wheel velocities. And that's what's going to allow us to steer and go forwards or turn with our robot. The added difficulty here is that the, oh, I will admit someone else to the room. Uh, the only added difficulty here is that since the wheels are separated from the center of rotation, there is going to be added skidding uh, with the vehicle. We're going to uh, do give more details on that on the next slide. And lastly, the, we have the Ackerman or car-like vehicle. This is probably the most well-known steering geometry. Uh, how we uh, turn with this vehicle is slightly different. Uh, the wheels are typically going to go all at the same wheel velocity. Our, however, to turn, we're going to define a steering angle that is given by the phi variable here. Uh, this, vehicle, this vehicle type is very useful. However, uh, for our project, we use the skid steering geometry. Uh, why we do this? Uh, the first, uh, uh, first reason is that it's a, it has robust and simple driving mechanics. So since the front wheels don't need to turn, we simplify the, the drivetrain and that allows us to uh, be, have a more robust platform. Also, it has very high maneuverability on complex terrains. And lastly, uh, this platform time allow, uh, platform type allows for zero radius turning, so the robot can turn on the spot, and that allows it to be uh, more efficient when driving off roads. However, this vehicle type has some very high inherent skid living dynamics, and those dynamics are very hard to model. And this is the subject of the article that we sent to CRV. As you can see, when the robot drives, it tends to go sideways a lot when it tries to turn. That's the, the part that's difficult to model. So we took a look at the uh, literature related to robot deployments in winter conditions. And as you can see in all of those pictures, those robots tend to be deployed in relatively large and open areas in winter conditions. So those areas, they don't require such a accurate motion model. And that's why we, we saw that there was no literature that was uh, specifically uh, made to, to, uh, to work on motion modeling in snowy environments. So that brings us to the contributions that we uh, proposed for our paper. So for this paper, we uh, analyzed five kinematics from the state of the art for skid steering mobile robots, which we will call SSMRs for the rest of the presentation. Uh, first, we evaluated their fitness for a heavy platform. So our robot is Alphaton, which is much more than what is done in the state of the art. Uh, also, we evaluated the performance for each model on snow covered terrain. And lastly, we highlighted the impact of angular motion uh, to the, the motion prediction error that uh, we get from our models. So uh, why uh, for this article, we focus solely on kinematic modeling for SSMR motion. Why do we use kinematic modeling? We have two main reasons. The first one is that such models are much more robust to wrong parameter identification because an error in a certain parameter can be um, accounted for into another parameter. So basically, the, the parameter identification doesn't require 
such uh, accurate uh, values. And also, the such models don't require any uh, inertial information about the platform. And this kind of information is usually hard to get from the uh, platform manufacturers. So what does a kinematic do? A kinematic model do, sorry. Uh, it, what it does, we see in this equation, is it computes the time derivative of the robot state. So basically, the velocity of the robot body. So basically, we have the velocity towards the x uh, body axis, the y body axis, and the angular velocity uh, along the, the z axis. So basically, the yaw velocity of the robot. And this uh, model is defined as a kinematic model that will compute the body velocity values based on the wheel velocities on each side of the robot, as uh, explained with the input vectors uh, previously explained. In other words, what, it, what we do with our model is we give an estimation of the, the, the rate of change of the states. Why is it an estimation we call? It's because the models will never give us uh, really accurate values. Uh, this is limited because the, the only input we have for the models are the wheel velocities. And we need much more uh, measurements to get a, an accurate uh, measurement of the, an accurate estimation of the robot position. So uh, what, uh, in this paper, what we did for the formulation to make it uh, to simplify uh, the, the, the explaining the differences between the various models is we define each model as a Jacobian matrix that will link the, the input wheel velocities to the rate of change of the body velocities. Uh, each Jacobian matrix uh, includes some model parameters that need to be identified. So we will give, uh, in the next slide, we will give an overall idea of all of the models and what parameters need to be experimentally uh, identified. So the first model that we present in the paper is a relatively simple model and still a very popular model. Uh, it's the ideal differential drive model. The, so we take the differential drive geometry that we explained before, since it's a relatively simple geometry. And we get the following Jacobian matrix. Uh, without going too much into details, the main uh, parameters that are important for this model are the wheel radius and the wheel baseline, which is the distance between the contact points for the two wheels. And the, for this kind of model, the, the robot will continuously turn on an instantaneous center of rotation that is defined here. And that center of rotation is based on the forward velocity of the vehicle and the angular velocity of the vehicle. So the first uh, model that is specifically uh, the, defined for skid steering vehicles is an extension of this aforementioned uh, differential drive model. So what uh, Mendo and uh, other authors have suggested in 2007 is that maybe uh, is that for a skid steering uh, robot, the contact points of the wheels on each side uh, of the robot with the, the ground uh, have a different uh, instantaneous center of rotation than the one of the old robot body that was also uh, presented in the differential drive model. So these contact points are found through geometric, uh, geometric analysis. And I will spare the old geometric analysis. To, we, you can get it in detail if you look at our uh, paper. We, uh, we have defined it, but for this presentation, I will cut it a bit shorter. Uh, so the position of each of those centers of rotation, which are all located on the same axis, are what composes the, uh, the parameters of the model. And for this model, they, all, they have also added two wheel slip parameters. So we have a, an alpha L that defines the wheel slip on the left side and an alpha R that defines the wheel slip on the right side. So those are the parameters that come into account for this model. For the same model in the same paper, they have also made an analysis that if the axis that includes all of the instantaneous center of the rotation of the vehicle is located is parallel to the y axis of the robot's body uh, of the robot's body frame we can and also the distance between the each center of rotation for the wheels and this, the, the origin of the the robot's body frame is the same so basically the the centers of both sides are symmetrical we can do we can make the assumption that the model is symmetrical and that basically brings us back to 
the uh, ideal differential drive model, except that uh, we add two uh, parameters that will need to be experimentally evaluated. So basically, we have a new estimated best baseline of the robot. So we basically say that the robot might be larger to account for uh, losses in uh, rotation uh, motion. Uh, in angular motion and also we add a wheel slip parameter alpha that is supposedly the same for both sides of the robot and the distances between the the center of rotation are modeled through the y0 parameter that gives the estimated baseline so for this uh, symmetrical model uh, uh, wong and other authors in 2015 have experimentally found a relation between the distances between the centers of rotation uh, of the robot's wheels and it's uh, the, the center of the robot body frame. Uh, they have found this relation between this distance and that adds some uh, beta one and beta two uh, model uh, and lambda model parameters that we need to experimentally found, find. So basically this model now has three parameters. Uh, so, so this is another model that we presented in the paper. And lastly, the most kind of uh, conceptually simple model is presented by Anuzaki and other authors in 2004. This, uh, this is a simple but complicated to tune model. The, the model is a Jacobian that is only constituted of model parameters that need to be experimentally found. So there is no physical properties linked to these uh, parameters. You only need to find them through uh, optimization. So for all of these uh, model parameters, uh, we need to, to have a, an efficient way to compute them or at, at least find optimal values for them. So how do we do this? If we take uh, back our mobile robot that is located, for example, on completely snowy terrain and even snowy terrain, at time t0, what we're going to do is make a model prediction for the displacement of the robot that is shown in red here. So from T0 to T1, the robot should, based on our model, do about this, uh, this displacement. Then we drive the robot and we take a measurement with our localization algorithm that can be done, for example, with GNSS antennas uh, or vision-based localization algorithms. Uh, so we will compute the actual uh, displacement of the robot. And then we're going to use the following equation to compute an error uh, between the prediction and the actually uh, measured uh, state of the robot. So basically, we compute the difference and we multiply it by itself when transpose. The covariance matrix here is there to be able to compare uh, position, uh, translational errors with angular errors because the full state also includes the orientation of the body. So the goal of this matrix is just to put all of the values in, this, uh, in the same unitless value. What this equation gives us is a scalar value for the approximated error of the model prediction. And that approximated error can be summed throughout the whole trajectory. So now, for example, the robot is now in the T1 uh, position that we measured with our localization algorithm. We can make for another, uh, we can make another prediction, drive the robot, make another measurement. And then once again, we can use the same uh, error equation to maybe sum up the error uh, for the entire trajectory. For this paper, what we did is we just summed up this exact error throughout the trajectory, and we used an optimization algorithm that was uh, aimed to uh, minimize this error uh, scalar. So basically, this became our objective function. One important notion that was introduced through these figures is the horizon. So basically, the distance between where the model, uh, the robot is, and uh, where the model uh, is actually compared with the ground truth. This horizon for this example is shown basically in time, but the horizon can be defined spatially. So, for example, for this example, we have maybe six seconds between the the robot position, the prediction, and when it's compared to the ground truth. But this could be two meters, for example. For this paper, we used a, a spatial horizon because it allows uh, more numerical stability for when the robot is uh, idle, uh, idle, sorry. 
So for the experimental evaluation of all of our models, uh, not just uh, evaluation, but also model training, uh, what we did is we used our platform and we drove it on two uh, distinct uh, terrain types. So the first one being dry concrete in an underground parking lot located at the PEPS of University Laval. And then the, another one being uh, snow covered terrain located, located at the Grand Tax of uh, Laval University. So what we did is we drove two, uh, we drove, we drove two kilometers on both of these terrain types. Uh, we drove two separate trajectories, uh, one being for the model training, so to get the right model parameters, and another one being for the model evaluation. So in order to use the trained values of our models to get an idea of the performance of each model uh, on the same terrain type. What we did when we drove the robot is we uh, maximized the input excitement. So basically we tried to get as many uh, input wheel velocities as possible. Um, and finally, for all of these experiments, we use the iterative closest point or ICP algorithm for localization. This algorithm uses uh, point clouds as input and computes the rigid transform between the point clouds uh, of two positions of the robot in order to produce an odometry with uh, centimetric accuracy, which is much, much better than what we get from the model prediction. Therefore, it's a very interesting algorithm to use as ground truth for the tuning our models. And another interesting part of the ICP algorithm is that it produces some maps. As we can see here, we have a 3D map of the underground parking lot environment. We can see the pillars, we can see the walls. And in red, we can see a part of the ground truth trajectory that was generated. And also we can see another map of the uh, snow covered terrain uh, area that we draw in with the same ground truth of part of the trajectory. So for the results, the first interesting result is that for in this uh, figure, we uh, have trained the models on various uh, training horizons. So basically, the length of the window that we use for model training was uh, changed for each color. And what we can see is very interesting. We can see that when a model is trained on relatively small horizons, for example, the first two one at half a meter and one meter, it, the mod those models tend to perform better than uh, other uh, trained longer trained horizons for smaller horizons, which makes sense. However, when the model is trained, for example, at the longer training horizon, it tends to be more stable uh, as the evaluation horizon becomes bigger and bigger. Uh, so what we take away from this, uh, this figure is that the training horizon should be defined based on what application we want to do with our model. For example, if we want to do path planning with our model, we would need to have a model that is trained on the relatively large uh, training horizon because it's going to allow us to plan for a long trajectory. However, if we want to do control or uh, highly responsive uh, model predictions, we would like to train our model on relatively smaller uh, horizons. So now we have for every uh, four of the five models presented above, we have the result for the model prediction uh, accuracy. We didn't present the differential drive model in these because its error was uh, quite uh, higher than the other models, simply based on the fact that none of the model parameters, as we remember, it only used the wheel radius and the wheel baseline, uh, are based on real ground interactions. As therefore, therefore, the model is not trained with the specific terrain and has a much higher error. So we can see on the x-axis of both, uh, both figures, we have every different model. In red, we have the error on uh, concrete. And in blue, we have the error on snow. And on the left side, we have the rel relative translational error. And on the right side, we have the relative uh, angular error. So what we can see, what we can take away from there is that most models tend to perform quite similarly, except for the fact that the, both the extended differential drive uh, asymmetric model and the full linear model tend to have a better uh, translational prediction performance. And we attribute that to the fact that it's the two only models that can account for uh, translation, uh, uh, lateral motion of the robot's body. Uh, and also we can see that the extended differential drive uh, symmetric model tends to have a better angular motion prediction uh, performance than the other models, which is also an interesting result. 
Also, we took the extended differential drive asymmetric model and analyzed where did the error come, uh, errors uh, come from. Uh, so we tried to evaluate the error uh, based uh, the uh, translational error based on input uh, parameters, and we didn't see any real correlation. However, if we uh, try to evaluate the relative angular error based on the the input vector, vector. So on the y-axis, we have the right wheel velocities. And on the x-axis, we have the left wheel velocities. We can see that when the difference between both wheel velocities uh, gets gradually higher, so basically on the yellow areas here, uh, that means that the robot tends to turn. So we, if we have a large difference between wheel velocities on both sides of the robot, that makes the robot turn uh, more. We can see that there is a much higher uh, angular prediction error related to our models. So when we uh, implement such models, an important, really important thing to, to take into account is that much of the error will come from eye turning, uh, eye -turning uh, scenarios. So last result, and that's my personal favorite that we got out of the paper. Uh, it's not even related to any specific model. Uh, what we have in the way on the x axis here is the commended angular displacement. So basically, how much we ask the robot to turn for uh, every specific window. And on the y axis, we have the measured angular displacement. And as before, in red, we have how the, the, the robot behaved on concrete, and in blue, and blue, how the robot behaved on snow. So we have we found this result quite interesting, first of all, because we can see that. The measured angular displacement is higher on snow than on concrete for the same commended uh, angular displacement. That's interesting. That basically means that the robot turns better on snow. Uh, we didn't see this coming. It kind of surprised us. But when we think of it, it makes sense for the reason that when the robot is driving on snow, uh, it tends to uh, the, 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 the rotational move, uh, motion is, uh, tends to be due to the terrain being deformed under the wheels. However, when driving on concrete, which is very hard, the terrain does not deform, and it be basically becomes the wheels that have some deformation. So that wheel deformation is a, a bigger friction component than the, the actual terrain deformation. Also, we, we can see that when driving on snow, we have a much higher nonlinearity factor. And that's going to be interesting to take into account in future work. And lastly, uh, we computed the interquartile range for both of these distribu distributions is shown in the relatively hollow area. And this uh, allows us to see that the interquartile range is typically higher uh, on concrete than on snow. So that means for a specific uh, commended ve angular velocity, we have more possible values when driving on uh, concrete than on snow. So that means there is uh, more uncertainty to the motion when we drive on uh, dry and hard terrain. So this is it for the uh, paper's result. Uh, for future work, we're going to want to work on uh, dynamic modeling to take into account the friction between the wheels and the ground and maybe inertial components. Also, we're going to want to, instead of tuning the parameters offline and re reusing them for another trajectory, we want to be able to have uh, online tracking so our model become ad uh, adaptive as we uh, suggested in the figure where the robot uh, drives from road to a snowy path that's going to allow us our, our, our model to be more robust. And lastly, we want path following that will be robust to complex conditions so, such as snowfall and immobilization that is due to navigating in deep snow. So lastly, thank you for taking the time uh, to I really hope. I will be happy to answer any questions. Uh, and also, our paper is available on our website, which you can find at norlab.ulaval.ca. If you want, just do a Google search for Norlab robots, and you will find them. And also, you can search Norlab on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn to see our latest results, which we keep posting on there as we go along. So also, uh, I wanted to share the references that we used for this presentation for winter deployments and uh, the kinematic models that were presented uh, uh, in the theoretical section. So thank you. And uh, I will be happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, we are still at 19 participants, which is good.
Is there any questions from the audience? I tried to open my chat so I can see them too. So I will, I will start by to point out an uh, uh, interesting fact with that publication is that we, we published it to CRV and eventually that paper won the best paper for robotic vision and everybody was confused so they renamed the the prize only for uh, for Dominic's paper so now he, he wants the best robotic paper for for that conference instead because clearly there was no or not much vision in, in it so we have a question from Julien yeah uh, hi uh, thank you, Dominique, for the presentation. I, I missed the beginning, but uh, I think I, I got a good glance of everything. Um, had a, a few questions and or, or well ideas, and I, I don't know if you, you thought about that. Um, well, it's very interesting the difference between concrete and, and snow, and I think your analysis is good. That that's probably the well the friction of while well, the snow being much less, it is easier to skid ski, uh, skid steer. Um, and for um, what was interesting is on concrete, I was expecting to see, uh, well, a, a much more precise line. Uh, so your variation is interesting. And I was wondering, do you think it could be uh, the temperature as your tire warms up, uh, their properties change? So uh, that's something maybe it could be interesting to investigate. Uh, so tire as they warm up, they, they get suffer, so probably that, that, that could be something I could explain. And uh, and on snow, what's interesting is you're pretty sure that, that your tire will stay cold. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> that could help you in, 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 in terms of predicting what's happening. Um, so so that's one thing. And then, then I have a second question, but maybe you explain it at the beginning. I'm not sure, but uh, have you thought about using, as your, your model, one of your models in linear, have you thought about using Kalman filters and, and something well where you can have a, a faster uh, well parameter variation in your modeling? So uh, I, I think that's a very interesting question. You're actually pointing uh, towards our future work, so this is a very very good question. Uh, if I could just get back to uh, the initial initial slide. Uh, even though the models are defined as Jacobian, so basically linear relations between the wheel velocities and the, the, robots, the robot's body velocities, uh, all of those, in order to get the actual uh, displacement of the robot, we have to compute the transform between the body uh, reference frame and the word reference frame. So those uh, uh, rotation matrices uh, make the, the, the models become nonlinear all the time. So even though we start with a really simple linear model, we always uh, explode to a nonlinear model. But that doesn't prevent the state, the state of the art from using uh, Kalman filters. What they do is they linearize the, the dynamics and they use extended Kalman filters to track the model parameters. Uh, what we find uh, and our idea for future work is that uh, linearizing those dynamics might not be enough to account for really large uh, parameter variations. For example, if you drive on uh, the road and then you want to cross a snowbank, your tires are going to start spinning like really freely in the snow and you're going to try to almost Im immobilize. Your robot is probably going to be immobilized in the snow. And to account for like those very large parameter variations, what we want to do maybe is to uh, work on more advanced uh, um, parameter tracking or to allow the robot to find which uh, nav motion mode it might be in. Or So it's a very good idea to use Kalman filters. It's what the state of the art does to track model parameters. Uh, and what we want to do next is to make it super robust to large parameter variations. I, I may add for the heat building up on, on the tires. That's true that we didn't do a temporal analysis and we should go back and, and dig into that. Something that is sure is that this robot is made for off-road driving. So the pressure in the tire are very low. 
uh, so that we can climb over rocks. And I think we have pictures of, of that that eventually we should add. But when we turn on spot, the wheel essentially bend. So it gets stuck on, on the concrete and the old tire bend for close to 10 centimeters. Sometimes you have the feeling that just the tire will tear apart uh, <laughs> because the friction is, is too so high. So for sure, we are building heat in, in that thing. Uh, and But maybe faster than than what you think uh, so it might be that in the few minutes we uh, we we already saturated the the heat that the the thing can can hold uh, but but that's indeed a, a good point and that that was the old old message about all of those uh, kinematic model with fixed parameters is that the the wheel are actually moving on the ground so the contact point on the ground is 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 moving quite fast actually because of all of those deformation and of course the tires are most probably stiffer on ice and and would just slip um, so maybe more stable because of that this is interesting because uh, uh, well as you just said the, the high deformation then if i don't know if you uh, you know um those brush model of tires but at high deformation the behavior change because you have full slip under the tire well when when the, the well the, the the deflection is not that great you have a part that slip and the other one that, that grip so that could be interesting to investigate but I think your your model was quite linear so probably that that that's not the case but for the snow it's it's something quite quite similar to that so maybe it's a it's, it's a brush model ish because well it's more the snow that deflect than the tire but that's very interesting. I think where your expertise with uh, model deformation or model behavior uh, for tire the tire level becomes really interesting is when we try to look at dynamic modeling, where what they do is they try to uh, model for a force vector that will be at the exact wheel level and then uh, export it to the, the body re reference frame so that we can, you can transform a uh, tire, le tire level model to the whole body for every wheel, that, that would become really interesting to look at uh, with diff because you can just add the different uh, wheel uh, friction model and try to see what it does to the whole body behavior and then evaluate it with uh, localization algorithm that is uh, very strong expertise in our lab. Yeah, indeed, yeah. And something we figure out is that the, the models that we find in the literature, even 2017 is not that old, are super simple. <laughs> the contact point uh, are simplified. Now if we have four contact points there. Uh, they, they assume that it's a single track and everything is super simple actually. And there, there's, now we have the computing power to actually take care of, of that properly. Uh, the question is, do we gain 1% or do we gain 20% on, on the, the accuracy. OK, is there any question from someone else? Otherwise, I can go back to Julien <laughs> or ask a, another question. OK, I will. Try something. So in your videos, you're showing a robot with four wheels and then with tracks. Mm -hmm. um, do you foresee any change or what do you think will happen? If I recall well, you, you did the, 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 this paper with uh, tires. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think will happen if we, we change and, and put four tracks? Do we need to retune everything? Do we need to re-experiment or? So basically, it's a very good question. Uh, basically, uh, when when acquiring the platform, we uh, have also acquired tracks for the simple reason that tracks are have a much better uh, maneuverability in soft terrain. So basically, uh, when we go to really deep snow, the tracks are going to allow us to navigate where the wheeled robot would just get stuck. So that's what why we got those tracks. Uh, of course, the model parameters will be uh, drastically different when changing from the, the wheels to the tracks. So there are two uh, areas that might very be much different when using the tracks. First off, if we imagine the robot is in the air and not even moving on the ground, 
uh, the tracks are much higher, uh, much more require much more energy to get turning. So the actual uh, powertrain dynamic model of the tracks will be really different without even talking of the wheel to ground interaction. And the second one is exactly that the, the tracks with the ground, they will behave really differently. And this is why in the lab for the next part of the, the experimental uh, evaluation of all of our models, we're building a, uh, an automatic uh, calibration uh, program that we can launch with our robot before, for example, doing a, an off-road mission uh, at the forest. So the robot will autonomously uh, drive itself and try to stimulate the, the input uh, variables in order to be able to tune itself. So as we go along uh, experimentally, our goal is to be able to take any robot uh, and make it drive itself. Uh, and after that, do a model, tu model tuning to get uh, good initial values for our models. And then the goal is to be able to track the, the motion parameters. So when the robot, for example, if it starts on concrete and then goes to deep snow, uh, we want to be able to be robust and adaptive to this kind of change in behavior. All right. Um, is there any questions for the audience? I see that we are getting close to lunch time. <laughs> Maybe just a small comment from me. Uh, I guess, did we try it or did we discard the idea that uh, we could train in all those models, then chop them in half? Because in your, in your plots, uh, the Angular part was better for some and the translation for some. Could we have just chopped them in the middle and used the, the better parts? Or would that break actually the training part? Uh, since the training uses the whole uh, state, uh, it could be uh, it could maybe be more difficult. But I think where your ID becomes interesting, if you recall the, sorry, I will get to the actual slide of the error computation. If we recall the error computation uh, formula, we remember that there is a covariance metric that is used to put all of those. Uh, translational and angular values to a common uh, unitless value, we could actually uh, use the covariance matrix to increase the importance of the angular motion in model parameter training. So that might be a way to actually get some models more uh, robust to uh, angular motion. But you're also right that maybe combining uh, like uh, Asymmetrical models with symmetrical models that, that are, so as asymmetrical models they behave better on uh, with the translational prediction. Sorry, if as we can see here, the, the two models here are asymmetrical. So we could use those models to predict the translational uh, displacement and then use a symmetrical model to predict only the, the, the rotation of the robot. That's a good idea. I haven't, I didn't think about that, but that could be uh, something that we look into. On the other hand, uh, since we already have full linear uh, model, which is just a, uh, was it like that? We, we were training a matrix, all six uh, numbers there independently. That already probably should be able to cover these two models. Mm -hmm. but, uh, just the training, just training was not so easy to to get the, because in this plot, you can see that the full linear is good for translational part, but quite uh, fuzzy for rotation. Yeah, we, my, my idea of chopping those two models, since they are linear, mm. we, could, we should be able to express that uh, by the full linear, but I just take me the numbers. Mm. Otherwise, the, the state of the art, the, where the, the, they uh, kind of highlight the, the error sources, it's been related to wheel acceleration and not wheel velocity. So you could ex extend the, the input vector to take into account the uh, wheel accelerations. And such models, they also add uh, dynamic models to reason with the, the wheel friction on the ground mm -hmm. and then just generalize it to a whole body geometric relation. So you add computational complexity, your model takes longer to compute, but usually it gives more accuracy. Uh, that's what the state of the art is doing like the, the one or two last years. Mm -hmm. It's true that with just linear models, as was mentioned before, we are kind of chasing, chasing ghosts here. <laughs> Because uh, those six numbers are definitely not enough to capture. And there also are so many influences from the environment, which we don't take into account at all. So, yeah. 
All right. So I would give the last word to Annette. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Dominique, for your presentation. Uh, in the coming two weeks, uh, je sais pas si je devrais parler en français ou en anglais. <laughs> in the coming two weeks, we will have seminars from Institut Intelligence et Données, uh, EED. Uh, so next week, it'll be Professor Jacques Corbet from the Faculté de Médecine. Uh, il a une chaire en génomique médicale. Uh, and the following week, uh, Professor Philippe Després, uh, the Faculté des Sciences et Génie. Il se spécialise en imagerie médicale. Il parlera des sciences des données responsables dans le domaine de la santé. So the, the next two weeks will be EED. And you're welcome to join these webinars if you wish. Thank you. Thank you. See you all. Thank you for attending. Bye. <laughs> Thank you very much.